I'm Philadelphia City Councilwoman Kendra Brooks, and you're listening to the True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. Kendra Brooks is Philadelphia's political party crasher. Her success came from simply following the rules and hard work. Seeing a weakness in the Philadelphia Republican Party, Brooks decided to run for a city council at-large seat. There are seven at-large seats, and at least two are reserved for the minority party. You follow me here? Well, the minority party in Philadelphia has been, for several decades, Republicans. They would always win those two final at-large seats, basically by default. Brooks said, hmm, what if I ran as an independent from the Progressive Working Families Party... What if I were able to win more votes than the other Republicans running, which would get me one of those minority at-large seats? It's been done before, right? No, not really. It was a big ask. It basically had not been done in 100 years. Brooks beat the odds, the history, and ignored the blowback from angry Democratic elders to easily capture a win on Election Day in 2019. I interviewed Councilwoman Brooks one early morning during her first week on the job. She was trying to get a light replaced outside of her office so she could work even later into the evening. At large, Philadelphia City Councilwoman Kendra Brooks on the True Philadelphia podcast right now. Here with Councilwoman Kendra Brooks at large, Philadelphia City Council. Thanks so much for joining us on the True Philadelphia podcast. Thanks for having me. We are in your brand new office Mm -hmm. in City Hall. You've been a councilwoman for... Three days now? Yep, three yep, three official days. Weird being in your own office here? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I'm still like, wow. Whose office was this? This was uh, Councilwoman J.D. Blackwell's office. So there's a lot of history. It's I mean, a, a long-time councilwoman. Yes, there's a lot of history and um, a long legacy of Philadelphia politics that happened here in this office. So I'm honored. So how the heck does an inexperienced politician and third-party candidate end up at City Hall? Um, Hard work, dedication, and commitment to the people. That's how I ended up here, based on the work I've done around community organizing, um, around the city on various issues, um, being a voice of the people, and they elected me to fulfill this role, and I'm very excited and kind of honored to be selected. There's a lot of politicians who they get into a race, and they're like, there's no way I'm going to win this. It's the odds are against me. And then they're like, oh, my gosh, I won. Were you one of those people, or were you convinced that even against the odds, I could win this seat? I really believed even against all odds, I can win this seat. Our, uh, my platform was making sure uh, folks that have not been involved in the electoral process, that don't believe in Philadelphia politics and politics in general, how can we activate those folks, and those are the folks the most affected by the issues that I ran on. And as I was out talking to people in the community, just seeing people getting excited about something different, I knew I had the poss- I knew the possibility of me winning was 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 true. Like it was really possible that this could happen. Now you received, and I have the tally here, fifty five thousand four hundred forty four votes on election day. Mm-hmm. That was more than Billy Ciancalini received, and he was running for mayor. Um, How'd you do that? I think that my focus was kind of building a coalition of uh, people across race, class, socioeconomic status, um, gender, gender identity, and bringing them together around the issues. And I think people were excited about the issues, um, and they were excited to come out and try something different. And also being able to activate um, folks that were involved in politics, but had a lot of questions about what typical party systems have done for them, and that, that's what stimulated those 55,000 votes. They were excited about the fact that you were not a politician, you were not one of, a member of one of the major parties, mm-hmm. Working Families Party. What, what does Working Families Party stand for? Working Families Party stands for just what the title says, you know, the needs and the issues that affect working families across this country. Um, Here in Philadelphia, we've been focusing primarily on uh, electing quality Democratic candidates. So we have endorsed a lot of candidates, but I was the first uh, freestanding Working Families candidate to win here in Philadelphia. And it's really because we've been fighting on issues um, whether it's uh, poverty or uh, wages, housing, 
uh, education, all of these are the issues that we talk about nationally. Um, and I think that's what, it, that's what the Working Family stands for, about uh, electing quality candidates across the country um, that are dedicated to the 99% yes. and not the one. Rem remember that from Occupy Wall Street. Yes, yes, yes. That's, it's, it, would you say that that movement, that youth movement, way back when they were all camped out outside City Hall, mm -hmm kind of exists now in the Working Families Party? Yeah, I think, and a lot of folks that were a part of the Occupy are a part of Working Families Party, and I think that um, that was like the beginning of, you know, fighting for something new. At that time, we were fighting for change, but I think the realization is that in order for us to activate change, we need to be um, in it at all levels, and electing politicians um, that will fight for those issues is what we need to begin to do. And I think historically we haven't really done that. And now, you know, we see something different happening. You are from Nicetown yes. neighborhood in Philadelphia, and you still live there. Yes, I do. Is that important to you? Yes. Um, I lived in Nicetown most of my life. My grandparents lived in Nicetown. I have a deep commitment to, you know, to the Nicetown community. Um, yeah, my neighborhood means a lot to me. And, you know, folks in my community... Um, spent a lot of time and effort to get me elected. Um, so this is like big for, you know, North Philadelphia in general. Sure. You're a single mother to four children, mm -hmm. and I don't know how anyone can have the life that you have professionally and politically and still do that. How do you do that? Um, I have a strong support system. So my, I have generations of children, which is kind of funny. My oldest daughter is 29. And then I have a 21-year-old and a 15, 11. And I have a bonus daughter, which is actually my cousin that I raised throughout her lifetime. And she's 21. So I have a, a lot of adults around as well to help me with the younger children. And we just have a commitment to um, family and family values. Like yesterday, I worked late, but we met for karaoke with my daughters, my grandchildren, and friends um, as a way to maintain that family time that we need so I can run from City Hall down 11th Street to do karaoke with my family, and that's essential. My kids can come here and do homework or at one of my other children's houses. So all of those things kind of make it possible for me to be um, a committed and dedicated mom and grandma, but also committed to getting this job done as a, a servant for the people. I'd love to know what songs you karaoke to. Oh, gosh. I mean, just name a couple. Um... We, we did a lot of Whitney Houston last night. Oh, you did? Yes. Which, which songs? Some of the slow numbers no, or the danceables? I'm every woman. <laughs> it's all in me. See, I'm not the singer. My daughter sings. I just enjoy it. But that's one. Whitney Houston. How about uh, any, like, Philadelphia-based groups you like? Oh, jeez. I'm a big fan of the Roots because I, I think like that Questlove... Sucks. Questlove is the best drummer in the universe, but you like Jill Scott. Jill Scott, Kindred, Family Soul. Um, who else? I'm a big Daryl Hall and John Oates fan, too, you know, the Philly, Philly Soul. I, I, yes, yes. You, you, well, my kids weren't going to allow me to do any Hall and Oates at karaoke. Oh, okay. I wasn't allowed. They, <laughs> they're more accustomed to Meek Mills and, sure. and the go, Doll Girls or some kind of some, some more current stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I just sit there. And, I'm just happy to spend time with them. So I just sit there and listen. When I walked in, I mean, you were already here. I'm an early morning guy, obviously. So you spend a lot of time here already. You're in early. You're talking about fixing lights because you leave so late. And there are choices that you do have to make when you're trying to raise a family and, and have a community, have friends and have a job and have a profession and have goals. Mm -hmm. And so talk about, like, sometimes you're faced with two paths to go, and you have to choose. You can't have both. Um, well, family always comes first because um, that is my first responsibility to make sure that, you know, I'm raising healthy, productive Philadelphia citizens. Um, and how do I balance that? Like I said, my support system is amazing because I talked about my children, but I also have two teachers, two sisters that are Philadelphia school teachers. One is a, a daycare provider, um, which is like my best friend. Um, and we all live like within blocks of each other. So we have like this core network um, of familial support um, 
and they already know how important this is to me, but just how to maintain that. And I try to schedule time for each one of my daughters individually. And it usually means we meet up somewhere in the city, we do lunch, um, and we, this is just the beginning, and they've all been in here almost at least once. Into your office? Into the office. Are they me. amazed? I think so. Like, Mom, I can't believe this. Um, yeah, but my oldest daughter said I've always done amazing things. So to her, um, I was a teenage mom, so she went through college with me. So to her, it was like, this has always been our life. When, when in your life was it a goal of yours to enter politics? Recently? 2019. <laughs> <laughs> last year. Last year. It was it literally was last year. Literally. I was leading my um, Facebook memories. Okay. And um, I, I think it was like a couple days ago. And one of the posts that I put up, I was like, oh, that's when I made the decision based on um, in order to change um, the trajectory of our city, we need to get involved in the process or something like that. And when I read that, I was like, oh, that must have been the day that I officially decided that I was going to do this. And I was like, oh, wow. So it's literally a, a year ago. So you can kind of thank Mark Zuckerberg for sending out that you yeah, know, memories yeah, the on the memories. Facebook. I was like, oh, so nice. <laughs> Well, I mean, let's talk about the trajectory of the city. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the trajectory in its violence is at a path that it just can't be sustainable anymore. And it, I mean, we've seen murder rates, you know, reach these heights before. But what I think we've experienced, and I'm sure you agree, in this past year, the number of young children who are getting caught in, in shootings, whether they're not targets or even some that have been, mm -hmm. how do you change that trajectory? You know, I think... We need to invest more in people. I think we've kind of gotten away from investing into things that build character. Um, when we talk about gun violence, we have so, lack of resources, lack of educational opportunities, um, lack of employment opportunities, um, have folks in a sense of hopelessness. Um, and we need to find ways to um, overcome that hopelessness. Um, for me, understanding that with my daughters being of that age, they have buried more friends in their lifetime than I have. Um, so this gun violence thing has really hit me really hard. So I constantly am um, in conversation with young people about the why. Mm -hmm. Like what is getting, what, what is causing this? What, what could we do to stop it? Um, and overwhelmingly, you know, the reasons that people are out here are just like as an adult translating uh, young adult speak, it comes to you know, lack of things to do, like productive things to do, like quality jobs. You know, we have a whole generation that has been um, neglected by our educational system. You know, we think, I, I remember back when I was in school, we had extracurricular activities, we had all of these amazing things to do after school. Those things are gone. You know, they've been gone for 10 years or more in some schools. Um, no music, no arts, no dance, no barely a sports program. Um, we need to make sure that we're training up our young people to be productive citizens, and we've gotten away from that. I mean, education is important, but we're educating the whole person, you know, mind, body, and soul. So if we're not building or we're not creating young adults that are um, with some level of emotional t intelligence um, and character, um, we're going to continue to see a lot of this gun violence. And I think prevention is the number one, but also we have to come up with solutions for children who have already been neglected, or young adults, so to say. Um, you know, I intentionally take the path not traveled. So uh, sometimes I come in, I ride the subway in some days, and I walk underground. Um, there's way too many young people down here, like young. Living down. Living there. down underground. Teenagers. Teenagers, and it's heart is really heart wrenching. Um, and we think about how you know, not just education, our homelessness population among young people is overwhelming, and not even just homeless living on the subway, homeless couch to couch. You know, we have to find solutions to get back to taking care of our people um, and our children because we're losing them left and right. Um, if we're not protecting the children, we're losing a whole generation of Philadelphians, um, and we end up paying for it in the long run, whether we're paying for it through the trauma, because, you know, we have that um, passive trauma where 
you know, just hearing about the gun violence or just knowing that or knowing someone connected to the gun violence is still traumatic. And we we have to find a way to resolve those issues. So obviously it, it requires funding with the city and a commitment and a commitment from the community as well. And you want to try and invest in these things because you say in the end you pay in the long run, mm -hmm. but everyone is very much short-term thinking. Right. And you don't want to get to the point where the city, for instance, out taxes so many businesses that new ones don't want to come in or some of them don't want to leave. And so you're, you're kind of on the seesaw here where you don't want to tilt in either direction. How would you do that? I think when we, we talk about, you know, business development and business growth, we need that in order to stimulate jobs. But the reality is we need to make sure these are quality jobs because, you know, we've had some business growth. All of them haven't really brought quality jobs. We're talking about part-time, low-wage jobs does not pull people out of poverty. Um, like, for instance, the Amazon Distribution Center up in, I think it's Port Richmond. Right. Jobs, but nothing really to no sustain for yeah, your whole life. It's not full-time. Uh, part-time hours, no benefits maybe a decent pay, um, that's not a way to help pull people out of poverty. That's a temporary solution. Um, so we, you know, I'm really excited to begin this conversation with, you know, the business community. Like, how can we get the businesses to stay and want to grow in Philadelphia, but also find a way that Philadelphians can still live in the city and be able to thrive and grow, too? It should be a win-win. It shouldn't be a either-or. And I think that um, we need to think outside the box to make that happen. And I'm willing to sit down and have those conversations to move that. Because people want to say that I'm anti-business, and I'm, I'm really not. I'm pro-people. And um, in order for us to even stimulate the businesses here, we need to make sure people have money to spend in them. Mm -hmm. And currently, you know, a lot of people are struggling here in Philadelphia. Our poverty rate is ridiculous. And... We need to have opportunities for people to, you know, live and stay here. And we can't do one or the other. It has to be a joint venture with business and community to kind of, you know, to find ways to, for both, for it to be a win-win. When you say you want to have quality businesses, that, I mean, that's great. But what if it's just, I just want a business to come in? Like, it's a beggar's not being choosers situation, don't you think? I mean, I feel like any old business won't do. Like, I mean, other country, other cities, I mean, I'm trying to think of an example and I'm not coming up with off my head, but they're, you know, just because a business comes in, it doesn't mean they're going to do right by. Uh, I hate to bring up Amazon again, but that's what happened up in New York City. Yeah, like they can't, yes, they came, people were, weren't, they didn't deliver on their promises. Or they didn't think that they would. Right, and, and then, you know, the city spent a lot of money to court them and get them there. And we still end up losing. Do you think it's wrong for a city to, to pay money? To, I mean, Philadelphia was, had a huge program to try mm -hmm. and attract Amazon here. Do you think that's wrong for a city to spend money that way? I have mixed feelings on that. I don't think it's completely wrong, but I think the amount of money that we're spending to court business to come into the city, we need to make sure it's real, they're really going to be benefiting the people. I think a lot of times, you know, we make decisions based on... Um, uh, short term, short yeah, short term uh, advantages of this. Not thinking like in long term. If they're not, if we if we're expending millions of dollars to get someone to come to our city, and our benefit is not going to double, it's a waste. Of, that's throwing money out the window. We need to, we need to think like a business as well, and not allow businesses to kind of manipulate us. And a lot of times, I see we th we're throwing money. Um, at corporations, and we don't get the same, you know, bang for our buck here in Philadelphia. Do you think the sports teams kind of done that in the past with the stadiums being built and off of, you know, city-funded dollars? Yes, yeah, so it's good. Taxpayer money is spent for that, but we don't have money for affordable housing. Would you tell the Eagles and the Phillies if they wanted another one to say, uh, you just build it yourself? They could. I'm not, I mean, I love sports, so you, you, you treading up with <laughs> I do enjoy sports. Um, I mean, we, we saw the, the Rams, the St. Louis Rams left town after the St. Louis built them a new stadium and went to L.A., and they were left held, holding the bag. We need, to, we, we need to use that same business smarts when we're making decisions as a city. You know, I think we keep getting excited by this shiny new thing, and the shiny new things a lot of times leave cities 
holding the bag, like you said, in St. Louis. Um, it hasn't been that bad here in Philly, but I think that everyone needs to pay their fair, sh fair share in Philadelphia. You know, Philadelphia is a debt. We're talking about sports. Philadelphia is dedicated to their sports. Like, Philadelphians love Philadelphia sports teams. Um, and it should be a win-win on the sporting teams as well. They're a million, billion-dollar corporation. You know, everyone needs to kick in to make sure that if we're talking about Philadelphia pride, everyone is paying into that Philadelphia pride. Because, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish your, finish your thought. I lost it real quick. <laughs> I made you lose it. I'm sorry about that. I hate doing that. Tax abatements. That's another thing that's a giveaway with the city. You build here, and you don't have to pay taxes for a certain number of years. And I know they've been talking about this in city council. Do you see it as a, as a nice tool to attract people in places that may not be so attractive, or do you think it's a, too much of a giveaway? I think it's a big giveaway, and I think the, the reason it was created, we did that. We stimulated growth in Philadelphia. Yes, development is wonderful, but we can't do development. There's displacing Philadelphians. Like, we built all these nice, shiny new properties, but we haven't taken care of um, longtime Philadelphians that were displaced that have been outpriced of, out of neighborhoods, um, that have some ended up in homelessness. Um, yeah, so I fought to end takes the tax abatement. Like, before I even decided to run for office, I was a part of um, the Our City, Our Schools coalition that was fighting to end tax abatements and asking for pilots for nonprofits, especially Penn. Um, and I saw the decision that was made before I elected as a, a, media, a, a small win, because at least we got 50% of what we wanted um, in terms of the rollback, but we were, in, we were going for an ending the 10-year tax abatements. I think that people always talk about, you know, the poor people, um, poor people in welfare, but we continue to give corporate tax breaks that are equivalent to rich people welfare. Like, if we're giving millions and millions of dollars away um, and it's not benefiting the whole of Philadelphia, I don't understand what the, I think, you know, we criminalize poverty um, and then we give breaks to rich people. That does not make sense. And tax abatement is one of those things. And I know it's a very uh, controversial issue here in, in City Hall, but I still believe that we should have ended the 10-year tax abatement. You know, my colleagues made a decision to roll it back. Um, and I would like to continue to see how many um, things we can get like add it to what they already put there. Like we need more community benefits agreements. We need to make sure we have affordable or low income housing and some of the development that's happening. And we haven't um, pushed the developers, you know, to balance that out. Like we're giving you something and we get nothing in return. Our schools are falling apart. Housing, we have a housing crisis here in the city, but we're giving away millions and billions of dollars here in the city and we have to find a better solution. So that was my tax abatement. Was a that's like number one on your list. Yes, that was like the number one. That's what I've been fighting for. So I'm still trying to figure out what other things we can get from that and what that's going to look like going into our next session. Is it healthy that Philadelphia is essentially a one-party town and has been for so long? I know you're not a, in the Democratic Party, but essentially people would say, well, they're basically Democrats, just a little bit more progressive. Is it healthy to not have Republicans basically winning anything in the city government? I think um, when, there's, when there's good quality competition, it makes people do better. I think that... Um, I think my win was attributed to um, the Rep Republican Party never really had to run for their seats. They never had to really run a solid campaign because they knew that they were going to guarantee these two seats and the Democrats are going to do their thing. Um, I think that in order to get the votes for Philadelphians, everyone needs to do their just diligence, meaning talking to the people, making sure we are um, increasing, increasing voter turnout, and that's regardless of what party it is. Um, I think... You know, fair competition is a way to, is a benefit of the people because we get to vote in the people that we want to have in. Um, and historically, our system hasn't been designed to do that. So you think you woke up Republicans and maybe you're going to make them better? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. We will see. I hope I woke up some Democrats too. <sighs> I mean, you know. You did. I mean, this is, Bob this Brady, is for the people. Bob Brady, the head of the Democratic City Committee, was 
essentially threatening people to not support you. Mm -hmm. When you first heard about that, what did you think? That's not democracy. Like, our goal should be to make sure people are out voting for people that best um, support their issues and their interests. And I feel that's regardless of what party you, you come from. Um, I mean, I understand he had to maintain the status of his party. Um, but I really think the focus should be making sure more, pe more people are coming out to vote. And Did that embolden your supporters rather than hurt your candidacy? When he's, he said, don't support her or yes, else. Yes, because when people like, like most, a lot of folks that decided to go ahead and support me, it's like, who is he to tell me that I can't support someone who's fighting for my issues or someone that's been boots on the ground at my school or at my event or came to support me when I was homeless and was willing to help me find housing? Why, you can't tell me, you know, because of a party, I can't do that. That's not what democracy is about. And I think that's what kind of he, you know, got people excited to support and back my candidacy. The Working Families Party, again, is very progressive in its ideas, extremely liberal compared to, you know, centrist Democrats, I guess. How do you, and I know it's not your problem because you're in the city of Philadelphia, you're in city council, but, you know, people out in the upstate areas of Pennsylvania, they don't see any of the problems that are the top issues for your party are problems at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and when it comes to homelessness, when it comes to gun violence, when it comes to rent control. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you grow a party with these ideas that are so far away from even center? I think even when I've talked, uh, when I've spoken to people across the state, um, 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 I've done a lot of work across the state, just in general, mainly around education. Um, and I find that even though those issues aren't highlighted across the state, they're real everywhere we go. You know, homelessness just looks different in rural areas. Homelessness looks very different in the suburbs. You know, I think um, talking about these issues aren't that far removed from the majority of Americans. I think um, the reality is that being poor is, is, is so stigmatized that people wouldn't classify themselves as that. But once you start having real conversations with people, you realize that a lot of people are barely one check away from being homeless. You know, barely. Or a car accident or a health scare. A health scare, whatever. Um, so the need for these simple things like a minimum wage increase across the state, I don't think people are opposed to that. Um, rent control, especially if you're living in areas and um, the cost of living is growing, or in areas that you're being pushed out because of lack of jobs in certain rural areas and you have to move to the largest city to be able to um, work but can't afford to the rent there. And it doesn't have to be Philadelphia. I'm saying largest city in terms of if you live in one of these small counties right. as opposed to like a I don't want to call anybody's little town because people get offended about their places. You don't have to. <laughs> I know what you mean, yeah, because yeah. the Twitter's out there and they hyper-focus on things and yeah. it blows up. <laughs> yeah, let, let's talk about rent control because in New York City it's had some effects that were completely the opposite of what was intended where you see properties aren't maintained anymore because we know we're, the landlord's not going to get any more money and there's no mobility anymore. Do these types of things worry you? No, I think that we have examples of where rent control worked. We see we have examples of where it failed and didn't and it didn't work right. I think we need to take all of those examples to create what we need to have here in Philadelphia. Um, I, like when we think about landlord tenants, right? There's a lot of landlords that don't have rent control and don't take care of their properties here in Philadelphia. <laughs> that is true. I know firsthand. <laughs> You've lived in one. Yes. So I mean. That's the reality that we live in. I, I really believe in balance. Like, I do believe that, you know, people have the right to make money. Um, but we have to take care of our people. And I think the rent control gives people the opportunity to live in quality housing at a fair rate. You know, I have a friend who lives in South Philly. She lived in the same property for 20 years. And all of a sudden, the landlord wanted to increase the rent, like, double Basically because the landlord wanted that person out. Right. Um, and we really had to fight to stabilize a fair, you know, fair market rate for the property. And 
that shouldn't happen. And they want it immediately, not like six months when your lease is renewed. We know this year, like next year, we plan on doing this. No, it was like 30 days. Like, who? Most people can't come up with too much rent and security in 30 days. Um, and we need to as, as we need to make it um, fair for renters, but also understand, you know, that landlords want to make their money too. I think it has to be a balance. The school reform commission is gone. Mm -hmm. There is now a locally controlled school board in the city of Philadelphia. Do you wish that the members were to be elected by the people of Philadelphia? And how how do you see the system now as any different than before? Well, I was a part of the nominating panel for the new school board, um, and it was a it was a eye opening process. I think that might have been the first time I thought about city government differently okay. through the nominating panel. Um, I was a, I'm definitely a proponent for elected school board. After going through this whole electoral process here in Philadelphia, um, I still would like elected school board. I, but I, we need to think it through. Um, the electoral process here in Philadelphia is different. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and I wonder what that would look like if we're trying to get a school board that uh, is diverse and meets the needs of the diversity in Philadelphia. And it was the same thing with the nominating panel. When we we're on a nominating panel, you know, as an activist, just trying to find. Um, or trying to create a level of diversity on our current school board was very difficult um, when you know we have people with such high credentials and then we have folks that are at, uh, that were applying for more of like movement spaces activists that didn't have the same credentials and trying to figure out how do you weigh those against each other you know and I'm gonna use myself as example so if well I'm probably not a good example but because I do have credentials too, but like being an activist and the work that I've done, um, how does that weigh to someone who's a, a professor at Penn? You're closer to the people, whereas that other person has more experience in the theory of things, exactly. right? Exactly. So how can you put those things together? Important. It's theory rare to find both of those things together. Right. Theory and practice. We need to find a way to marry those things. And, you know, in theory, elected school board would give us that. But in reality, the way money is involved in politics, I'm not sure what we will end up with in the end. And not enough people participate in the electoral process in yeah. Philadelphia. I mean, we are, you know, the amount of people that come out to vote is it's dismal. Right. So, I mean, that's why we have to increase voter turnout. Voter education is important for multiple reasons. Whether we move towards elected school board or not, I think um, just educating people more on the importance of voting and what it looks like. Because it eventually, even whether we have an appointed school board or elected school board, it all works together because the mayor selects the nominating panel and the mayor ultimately has a decision on who those folks are that are on the school board. So we need to make sure that we're electing people that support the things that are most important to us. And it all goes back to getting involved in the process. So the, the local school board is basically pretty new still. Do you find encouragement? Do you, do you think it's any different than the SRC running thing? Um, I think they actually did just better than before. I I think the first vote that I was really excited about, they voted down any new charters. Um, I, that might have been last year. I haven't been in any school board meetings this year yet. But um, that was a pleasant surprise because we saw the School Reform Commission steadily, steadily create more charters. Are you okay with charters, but at a certain number? I think at this point we need a moratorium on charters. Our current school district is strapped for cash. Should there should. be fewer? Charters? Yeah. I think that we need to have proper um, oversight of the existing charters before we continue to expand this on taxpayer dollars. We have no control over what charter providers do. You know, I think from the activist side, I'm speaking as the activist side, when we were trying to um, um, FOIA information um, around charters, we got limited information. Philadelphia Public School information is readily available. You know, I think we need to... Um, more oversight, more, basically. Yeah, get, get a grip on what we're doing first um, before we expand or create any new charters. Um, and, I, and I think that's the fair thing at this point. Like, we don't have money. 
Our existing schools are falling apart. Uh, we need to do some major infrastructure changes in like the 216 buildings that we own. That should come first. We have to prioritize our own first before we you know, start giving out money to outside providers. That generally would mean more real estate taxes, a rise in that, I to get we, the funding coming in? Well, if we had the tax abatement, we would have money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get it another way then. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, a, a, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to be offended by this question. Oh, okay. Do you have any wealthy friends? Um, it's like super wealthy. What's, I don't know what super, uh, these days I'm not sure what super people who People are, you try and describe what they do and you can't because they don't seem to have a job. They're so wealthy. <laughs> so, uh, not that I know of. Do you think it's okay to be that rich? Um, I, I can't say because you don't know how people got their money. Suppose you inherited it. Okay. You know, it's different. people have get their money different ways. So I don't know too many super, super rich people, I don't think. I know some people that are, are doing pretty well. Okay. And Do you think it's a problem in the Democratic Party or in your party or, or other causes where they feel like the wealthy have done something wrong by amassing such a large pot? I do believe that um, those who have more should fairly be able to distribute that. I think currently the way our system is set up is that, you know, the wealthy the wealthy get more breaks than, you know, poor or working class people. And I think that needs to be distributed because it doesn't make sense for us to continue to tax poor people and give, you know, payoffs to rich. Yeah, like, like the example I always bring up is the capital gains tax mm -hmm. is generally lower than the tax that these people would have paid on their income, and so by gaining money through like stocks and, and everything else mm -hmm. brings them that advantage that other people can't take advantage right, of. Right, yeah. And that's, I, I think that's the way the system is set up. I think that, you know, it's not right. I th this, is what, this is what I use again, because I have a lot of socialist values, <laughs> and I do believe that wealth should be distributed, and I don't think we should nix people for having, you know, for having a lot of money, but I think we should be equally responsible to distribute our wealth. And when I say wealth, whether it's my $20,000 or your $20 million, if I'm giving 15% of my wealth, you should be given 15% or more of yours as well. And I think the system is not set up to do that. We just see constant taxes on working class and poor people where we continue to give breaks. Like the one you talk, like a, the gains that I got. That one gets you. Yes. <laughs> Should everyone make the same amount of money? That, no matter what you do? No, I mean, I think... I mean, we're getting into, like, this utopian idea of, like, yeah. everyone's happy, everyone's, everyone feels like they're getting their fair share, and, and we as human beings, it just is impossible because we always want more. Right. And so how, how do you form this idea of, like, bringing socialism into a capitalist environment and not creating a whole bunch of losers and a whole bunch of winners who the losers think don't deserve it in the first place. I think, so I, 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 this is how I look at it. In terms of, you think of fair wages, right? I'm, and that, that's how I'm going to look at this. Um, we think that some of these large corporations where the top earner is making more money an hour than the person working in some of their, you know, sure. shops. That's and, and I'm talking about minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So we need to ensure that people are making a living wage. A living wage means that you can go to work every day, regardless of what kind of work you do. You can pay to live in a decent place, and you can afford to feed your family. I mean, the reality is when we think about a lot of low-wage workers work really hard. The more money you work, the more money you make, the less work you do. You pay other people to do your work. And, and the lower-wage earners are doing things that other people don't want to do. Well, and they're not, getting, they're not getting compensated for that. You know, coming from being a nursing assistant, I started my career as a nursing assistant, and I worked hard, and I did that through college. Um, once I, you know, graduated from Temple and then eventually Eastern, um, I was able to see that differently. Like, I work hard, but much, much differently. Go back to you, ask me why I'm here early and I leave late, because... That's my definition is definition of work is very different because when I was a nursing assistant, I used to work doubles from seven to eleven, 
pushing wheelchairs, changing patients, giving people, lifting people up, feeding all day. So for me to exert my energy in, in this, is, it's still hard work, but not the same. I have a lot of respect um, for people that do hard labor and not getting fair wages. When I did that, I got paid six eighty an hour. That was 29 years ago. Minimum wage is only seven twenty five. Seven twenty five in the state, yes. What should it be? Are you, are you at, in the fifteen dollar range? At least fifteen. That means it hasn't went up in thirty years. Is it okay for consumers to have to foot the bill and pay for more for whatever products you know these workers are producing? If the top dollar earners are making thousand dollars an hour, there's no reason why they can't lose something for their employee their employees to be able to gain. It shouldn't have to be put back on the taxpayers. Because you want your people to be able to spend money. You keep raising the prices. People will find other ways to do things. We, we have to find a way to balance it. It shouldn't. I think that um, just the, the balance of it all. People need to make more money, be able to have a decent place to live, be able to take care of their families, not at the risk that now everything is going to cost for more for me as well. That's not a balance because then we got to raise it again. Like the balance is finding ways where people can make more money and products and services are, you know, expendable at that level. So we can have the sort of growth in the economy and for the, the flow, we can flow if you have more money to spend. And I think that a lot of folks don't. And that's what we see um, happening currently in our system. Is there a problem that Philadelphia has had that you see is getting better, the solutions are coming? What, what's good that's happening right now in Philadelphia? Oh, we have some of, a, a lot of the worker right stuff that came about last year. It was very exciting. Um, Fair Work Week, um, uh, the, the eviction, the Fair Council with evictions. Those, I mean, we're making some, some strides in... Uh, so it's becoming a better place for people to earn a wage yes. to get a, to get a start on their career. But we still have more work to do. I think those are the things that really excited me. The uh, domestic workers bill passed. Like, there's so many good things that happen for working class people in Philadelphia um, that I'm really excited about. And I want to see that continue to grow. And I think we should be able to see some more of that stuff over the next four years. I want you to tell a story okay. about your time at the Pennsylvania Society. So a lot of people know what it is. It's up in New York City. Yes, it's the Pennsylvania Society. It's in New York City. And all the politicians go up there, and they have great dinners, and there's speeches, and, and champagne, and, and maybe caviar. I don't know. And what happened when you showed up? Everyone, everyone was very nice to me. I think... Um, I heard that they wouldn't let you in at first. Well, that's only one place, but on, on their behalf, we didn't RSVP. Okay. So I... But they're like, they weren't like, who are you? Well, the people at the desk were, but other folks were able okay, to come out okay. and verify who I, how I was. I don't know if you know this, but as a black woman, we get a lot of that in general. Sure. So it's like True. it becomes yeah. our norm, like people act that way all the time. Um, yeah, so it was, a, um, it was definitely an experience. Um, I wasn't completely a fish out of water, but um, people, most people were very friendly. I um, had a lot of questions because I never been to the PA Society. I actually never heard of it until it was like time to go. My colleagues encouraged me to show up. You didn't really want to go or you were half and half or? Yeah, I really didn't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, my colleagues said I should go. Um, my campaign team said I should be there. Um, it, it wasn't bad. I, I would plan better for it next year to go to attend again. But for me, the hardest part is when I came, I went and came, I stayed one night, came back, and went back in the morning because I had a, um, to speak to a group of paraprofessionals at Temple. And I got back to Philadelphia. I came straight from, um, was it the Penn Breakfast? Okay. Caught the train, came back to Philadelphia, went to Temple campus to talk to a group of um, paraprofessionals in the school district. Um, about organizing for a raise. And I was, I was in the background just listening. And the realization, it hit me, like I'm in this space. I actually cried. I just couldn't contain myself. I'm getting a little emotional now that 
at the PA Society, people with so much were not afraid to ask me for more. And people with so little were afraid to ask the same. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like we're asking for a you know, wage increase to be treated with dignity at work. And then, you know, someone else is asking me something that's about like a multi-million dollar deal to benefit none of these people that are asking for like sure. $5. Um, and just listening to those conversations and just the contradictions. How different it is for certain people on quickly. the surface. I think just that time. It, it wasn't enough time for me to process that between coming from the PAC society, walking in this room, getting ready to give a speech, and sitting in the background, hearing the discussions and conversation, I was like, hmm. I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I realized that running for office was the right thing for me to do because everyone wouldn't have that feeling in that transition. Um, and I did because my uh, campaign manager was there. She was like, what's wrong? I had to explain to her like what was going on. I was like, this is kind of overwhelming. So. You mentioned being a black woman. Sometimes you walk into an environment or a room or wherever and you will immediately feel like you're being judged, you're being treated differently. Do you feel like people are paying more and more attention about even subconsciously how they may be doing things? Do you think it's getting better that people seem to just be talking about it more? Um, and, I, and I'm talking about just like, just the way people treat other people who look different from them, whether it's gender, whether it's color, whether it's their, their paycheck. I don't know, I think we still have a lot of work to do. I think it, for me, it depends on what circles I'm in. I travel in a lot of circles and um, it, at least we're talking about it more and that's the start. You know, we're, 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 it's a part of the conversation and people, at least people know that they should be uh, cautious in judging people, you know, based on any of those things, sexual identity, um, color, class. But, I mean, it's still happening, but I think people are much more aware of it. Why do you think that trend is happening? It, some people say it's social media where people are hypersensitive and it kind of pushes the pendulum in the other direction. Do you buy that? That too. And I think young people don't have those same biases in the same way. I just think when um, my, my daughters are far more accepting of some things, like in my generation, we weren't um, I don't think we weren't accepted. And I, the way I see it is young people are so much more chilled out about things. Yeah, yeah, because they don't, it does, nothing phases my daughters. Like, they're all like, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's them. Let's keep on going. And it could be because of social media and what we see um, as norms. But I know I say, as, uh, but I think I'm a generation Xer. So am I. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we, we've, we've, we've I, I think we've paved that way from our bridge. parents yeah. to the next generation. But I'm always motivated to be around young people because my, my children have really brought me to a good chill. Because now I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. doesn't much, doesn't faze me. And I'm, my, my, my stepfather taught us not to be judgmental anyway. From when we were young kids, he told us we treat the janitor mm -hmm. and the CEO the same and you'll always be okay. And I've lived by that. Like even coming in, I speak to everyone. And I think that, I think that kind of attributed to how I won this campaign. Like I have friends on out, from the president of the union to, you know, rank, people, and file. rank and file. Yeah, like all friends. And I could have something and all of them will be there. And no one would know who's who. And I think, you know, I think that's a, that it kind of attributed to the popularity with the campaign. What's the best thing about living in Philadelphia? Oh. Or you can just name several. I love Philadelphia. I love Philadelphia's charm. Like we're- So we're charming? No, we're friendly enough. <laughs> but not overly, so I come from a Southern family. Uh -huh. So it's not, yes ma'am, how you doing? Hey, hey, hey to everyone. But you know, you give that smile and you nod if you see someone every day on your subway ride. Um, or if you pass them every day in Dillsworth Park, right. and then you run into them again somewhere else, you remember them. 
Um, I wish we could make a T-shirt saying Philadelphia, friendly enough. Just friendly enough. <laughs> just friendly enough. Um, so you love the people. I love the people. And the, the attitude. That we the have. attitude. What I like is that you, when you earn Philadelphia's trust, they will always trust you. They'll always fight for you. Yes. But you have to earn it first. You have to earn it. I think for me, like, we love our people. Like, no matter where you go, if you see someone else from Philadelphia, it's always love. And then they'll come out, and some people will be like, oh, I actually live in Lower Marion. That is not Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, when you're in Europe, yeah. you're like, yeah, I'm from Philadelphia. No, you're from Horsham, right. Montgomery <laughs> County. You're, it's a, it's a long drive away. But, um, yeah, we, we have, like, that, and that's, what I, that's our charm. Like, just nice enough. Um, How about, like, a place you really like in Philadelphia? I love the drive. Which one? Both Kelly Drive, Kelly and Martin, Luther Martin Luther King, because like you know, I live in North Philadelphia, and it's like right up the street. Mm -hmm. And then you hit there, you're like, <sighs> it's just a break from the traditional city, and you don't see too much city there, and you don't see that everywhere. Like I really appreciate that in Philadelphia. Um, food. Which place do you like the best? Oh, it's so it's a variety of food. Like if I want African food, I like to go to Goji's up in in West Philadelphia. And it's a Vietnamese place that I like also in West Philadelphia. And then it's um, a Mexican restaurant in South Philly that I like to go to. And, like, we have such a variety of cultures here in Philadelphia. I appreciate that as well. I wish that we would get over the cheesesteak. No offense to, like, all the cheesesteak makers, but I know you didn't. But, like, whenever someone from out of town comes in, like, oh, where do I get a cheesesteak? And you just mentioned three completely different places, all in different neighborhoods that you can go to to get authentic cuisine that's really good. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's a shame I didn't even mention a cheesesteak. I do have my favorite cheesesteak yeah, place, okay. but it's like... What's your favorite cheesesteak place? I used to go to Max's. It's close Where's to that? home. It's at Bruin area. Okay. Or like D'Alessandro, that's another one up in... Yes. That's my second favorite. I like Tony Luke's the best. Tony Luke's, that's the one. Oregon, Oregon Avenue. I'm not, Philadelphia. I'm not to try that one. I haven't been to Tony Luke's. We used to go to Louis Gu Gooey Louis. It's a place we used to travel to <laughs> all the way from Conshohocken. We used to come all the way to South Philly to get a cheesesteak. Um, but yeah, we have so much, you know, we don't talk about that enough in Philadelphia. We have like culture here. We have good food. We have museums. We have, um, you know, some of the arts like dance and, you know, we can... We have just enough. <laughs> it's not too much. Like when I was, one thing about PA Society, the location, my hotel was like right off of uh, Times Square. And I was like, oh God, this is a lot. Um, and Philadelphia is. Just enough people, just enough skyscrapers, just enough neighborhoods, just enough great food. Mm -hmm. And that makes it perfect. Kendra Brooks. Brand new at-large city councilwoman for Philadelphia. Thanks for joining me on the True Philadelphia podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Our thanks to Philadelphia city councilwoman Kendra Brooks. Let's hope she gets that light replaced in the hallway. We shall see how much she can shake up city politics and what alliances and coalitions she is able to build. I'm Matt O'Donnell, and this is the True Philadelphia podcast. <laughs>